ahead on Daytime Buffalo. We continue to celebrate Black History Month with the premier resource for African American women. And we have an idol in the making. We catch up with Matt Wilson about his amazing journey to become the next American Idol. It's all coming up right here on Daytime Buffalo. Good afternoon, hello, and welcome to Daytime Buffalo. I'm your host, Chelsea Lavelle. Thank you for joining us today for another edition of Daytime Buffalo. Today and throughout all of February, we are celebrating Black History Month. Now we're joined by Dr. Barbara Nevergold, the founder of Uncrowned Queens Institute for Research and Education on Women Incorpor Incorporated. Thank you, Dr. Nevergold, for oh, being with us. Thank you for inviting me. And let me just say, I'm the co-founder. Co I want to make yes. sure I acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Peggy Brooks Bertram. Absolutely. Can you tell me a little bit about the Institute and what you guys do? Um, we started the Institute over 20 years ago and uh, was part of a group that was commemorating the centennial of the Pan American Exposition. And we looked at the role that black women had played in that exposition. Nobody knew about that history. And so we uncovered that history. We looked at the women's groups. We looked at the protest rally that they, that they did, they held uh, in 1900, and found that there were so many women, uh, African-American women, whose history was not known, uh, or it was lost, or you know it just hadn't been recaptured. And so we started documenting those histories to make sure that they never get lost. And we established our webpage uncrownedqueens.com, now it's uncrownedcommunitybuilders.com mm -hmm. because um, we expanded to include men after several years. Absolutely, yeah. and you guys recently, for this Black History Month, opened a new exhibit. Can you tell me about that? Yes, it's called Say Their Names, Honor Their Legacies. And the idea, again, was to make sure that we document and we record uh, the histories and the experiences of African-American community builders, and particularly those who are elders, because we know there's an urgency to make sure we capture those histories before they're lost. And so our thrust was really to reach out to those individuals in their 70s, 80s, and 90s who are elders and ask them to come in and be interviewed. We collaborated with a fantastic photographer, Eve Blanc, uh, Richard, uh, each Richard Blanc, I should say, uh, who has Blanc Photographie. Uh, and it, we did, he did just a marvelous job. And so we now had photos of 11 um, individuals and videos of them talking about their lives, talking about the challenges, um, providing some advice to young people about how to overcome discrimination and racism that they encounter. What was the community response to your opening of this new exhibit? Uh, it was absolutely fantastic. We were overwhelmed with the support we got from the community, um, the auditorium at the History Museum uh, where the exhibit is housed was packed. Um, and people were really excited about being able to come out uh, again and to recognize uh, 11 of our elders. Now, this is a pilot program, so we intend to, con to continue it because we know there are many more than 11 people out there. That's right. That was my next question is what's next for the mm -hmm. Institute? What do you have coming up? Well, again, we're going to continue uh, to work on identifying uh, our elders. And many of these, I should say identifying, many of these people are still involved, still engaged in community building. Even at 80s and 90s, they're involved. And so we will continue to do that. But it's time now for us to also look at our web page. And the technology has changed so much in the last 20 years and actually the last 10 years when the last time that we updated the web page. So we're looking around now to see uh, about getting some funders, some sponsors that will help us to, um, you know, make the web page more technologically relevant in this age. Uh, how long is Say Their Names exhibit open and what days? Well, it's open um, during the, the days that the museum is open, Wednesdays through Sundays, um, but it will still be up through the spring. 
So uh, at least until June, people can go and see for themselves and read a little bit about these individuals. Now, we just have small blurbs about them next to their photographs, but if you go to the web page, you will find a longer biography. Okay, all right. Well, thank you so much for sharing more about your exhibit and doing that incredible work of preserving and sharing our black history, especially uh, women of color. So thank you for that. Please come back anytime. Well, thank you. If you'd like to go visit the Institute and see this exhibit, you can go to 984 Parkside Avenue in Buffalo or go to their website, uncrownedcommunitybuilders.com. We are closing out Black History Month by focusing on Black-owned businesses here in Buffalo. And here is one of them. Mark Parker, you are the owner of 716 Museum, Selfie Museum. Selfie Museum. Who doesn't love selfies? Everybody loves selfies. Exactly. Everybody loves selfies. Everyone loves ta ta love taking pictures, but we're more than just a selfie museum. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of cool things here. If you want to come here and have a birthday party, you can do a birthday party. You want to come here and, and throw a fundraiser, you can throw a fundraiser. You want to come here and do comedy, you want to do a play, anything, you can do it here. Absolutely. And we will work with you to make it happen. Very cool. You guys have this incredible space. I want to know what gave you the idea to start a selfie museum? My, at the time, my 12-year-old daughter. She gave me the <laughs> idea. I'm sitting at home, and it's a snowstorm. Drive tractor trailer during the day, and I'm stuck in the house. I'm aggravated. I'm mad. I can't do anything. I'm not making money. And she comes and knocks on the bathroom door. Daddy, I want to go do this. So I grab it, take a look at it, say, oh, this is, looks pretty cool. I said, I can build this. And I did a little bit more research on selfie museums and how they operated during the pandemic and how much money you can make and what it could do to, for our community here in Buffalo and restoring a smile, especially in a city that's blue collar and people need something to do. We need something different to do than just going out and having a good time in the middle of the night. <laughs> so this is an alternative to going out and doing that at night where you can do this during the day, you can do it in the midday, you can do it at night, and it's just different. First of all, I want to say, dad of the year, your daughter wanted to do something fun and you said, okay, we'll do it. I'll make it for you, okay? That's really, really cool. What did, what was the community's reaction when you brought this? The community's reaction was, was, was different. Um, we had a lot of people in the community come out and give us a lot of cool things, uh, like this couch that we're sitting on. I have a floor model TV. I even have the insurance paperwork to the TV. So <laughs> everything in here has a story to it. So when I would go pick up an item in the community, I got a good background on, on the item. So this particular year, we're going to be writing backstories to our exhibits. Nice. Um, bringing more things that represent Buffalo into it. Um, like Metropolitan Barbershop. We have a barbershop chair in the basement. We're restoring and we're going to rebuild Metropolitan Barbershop that was on Jefferson Avenue. Um, this morning I saw something on, on Facebook about Figmo's, the supermarket. So I said, you know what? We have a bunch of shopping carts. We have a whole bunch of food in here, plastic food items. We're going to re, re, uh, rebuild Figmo's inside the museum so kids can get a little bit of history, have some fun, but uh, an older person that's bringing their kid in can go, oh my God, I remember this back in the day. Man, 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 and there's a story. So he's excited, she's excited, they're, everyone's excited, and everyone's having a good time. It's more than just taking a picture, it's, it's just really the bonding. Yeah. And uh, reliving history in a different way. That's a really, really cool thing. Now, what does it mean to you being a black-owned business? It's everything. It is everything. When I tell you, you know, the struggle of our people and the story of time and how it, it always somehow in, in time we come short but we always find a way through not coming up short and coming out and doing it Try I'm it doing back. it um, when I got into got into trucking years ago I'm driving down Jefferson Avenue I'm coming back with the big rig and it was the old man sitting on the bench hey now I see you I see you <laughs> and I get that here in the selfie museum I get the knock on the window from the old guy I see you I see you you're doing it it's the it's the proud it's being proud and uh, proud about being African American and being somebody important in the community and giving back, especially giving back to my people. We need. Yeah, and and speaking of proudness, that's really what Black History Month is about, right? It's yeah. about acknowledgement. It's about being proud. Mm -hmm. What more does it mean to you? It is it's everything because I'm I'm a dad. You know, I'm a, tri I'm a driver during the day, I'm a curator at a museum, I'm a brother, I'm, every I'm everybody's friend, and 
to be in a position now where I can give back to the community in a different way, raise money for different causes, no matter what it is and how ridiculous it sounds, we're going to do it. Because everybody has a dream, and if I can be a part of that dream and make it happen for somebody else and see them go on and go on and be some big, something big, I knew that guy. I was there when he started. I want to be that guy now saying that from the window. You wear many hats, so hats off to you. I want to know what's next for the 716 Selfie Museum. What's next is spring. Spring, we're going to be jumping back into things, so we have a bunch of different theme parties coming up, um, some for children, some from adults. We're going to debut our Insta party, where we're going to pretty much give an individual the party for free. They have to pay for all the extra stuff that they want. Hey, they want an exploding cake? Pay for that. You want this? You want that? Pay for that. But that particular type of party will be free to the individual and will celebrate them with their family and friends and it'll be something cool. And we're going to be looking at expansion. We're going to be looking at moving out of Amherst and moving into the city of Buffalo and exploring the options of what we have there. Amazing. We wish you the best of luck. Congratulations on your success. If you, the viewers, are looking for one of the most Instagrammable spots in Buffalo, you know where to go. Thank you so much for letting us Thank stop you by your museum. Me. Thank you for having me. You can find yourself a perfect selfie spot at University Plaza or by going to 716selfiebuffalo.com. Now coming up after the break, we put an artist in the spotlight. We take a look at the art of Jalen Law. And we step inside a swanky 716 barbershop to learn what makes this barbershop anything but standard. Jalen Law is a distinguished artist here in Buffalo. You may have been walking around and seen some of his work on the walls of Buffalo. Hi, Jalen. Thanks for being here today. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. We are so excited to talk to you. I want to know how you got started as an artist. I've always been an artist. Uh, my origin story starts at the age of two. I've been drawing since the age of two. I've been selling my artwork since the age of four. <laughs> and I've been in business officially since uh, 2013 in my uh, dorm room. At the University of Buffalo. <laughs> You've always known what your path was. Absolutely. Um, uh, art, business, mm -hmm. as well as education were three important um, paths that I'm very passionate about. And I've always wanted to, I was always inquisitive about really figuring out how to bridge those things together um, to create a sustainable model. Who inspires you and maybe some of your work? Well, uh, in terms of inspiration, um, I can't go without acknowledging my grandfather because he was one of the uh, pivotal people within my life who recognized my talent early on. Um, and then from there, uh, my family, my mother, my father, my brother James, um, those are some of my central core people that inspire me to do the work that I do. I want you to talk about some of your recent projects, especially the mural in the town of Amherst. Yes, absolutely. So um, back in September, October, the town of Amherst, they um, selected me as one of the uh, lead artists to install a mural project um, on the uh, town of Amherst police training facility, um, which was previously the old Harley Davidson uh, a shopping center here um, in the community and I wanted to create a piece that would inspire and impact the broader community um, particularly the youth to really see themselves and imagine themselves um, as the next generation of doctors civil service workers um, and educators who all uh, primarily live in that area um, in that area and so I wanted to create an I a concept that would inspire those those types of uh, trains of thoughts of bridging those things together as, as my experience. And so 
um, as you saw within the concept, I did just that, but I also wanted to incorporate a augmented reality experience to it, which is what the viewers are seeing right now. So you can scan the artwork with your phone and the children will begin to look like they're running towards you through, uh, through your mobile device. That's really cool. Okay. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that. You kind of mend the digital world with your art, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, I utilize a lot of video and audio stimulation uh, through the artwork as a way of bridging traditional art with uh, the advancement of technological advancements. Um, people experience artwork um, in their own unique way and they learn in a unique way. And so I use all different modes and different uh, vehicles to stimulate that learning and that, that comprehension process, um, regardless of how you may, uh, may learn or comprehend. And so um, I've been doing this work for a couple of years, working with my team, um, technology team out in Texas. Um, and we are really looking to break the mold and explore how can we further make that impact through whether it's a painting or a large scale mural. I think that's Awesome, and also you do a lot of community outreach. You kind of touched on it, but you have more coming up, right? Um, yes, um, currently I am working on a, a mural, uh, leading a mural with uh, second graders at a, a local community center, Dorothy J. Collier Community Center. Um, and that mural is going to fall in lines along the themes of the previous mural of the town of Amherst. It's an indoor mural for the after school program and um, inspiring those th the, the thoughts of what does it take to be excellent in my own right? How do I define excellence? Um, and and that's, how, that's where the mural curriculum is leading them to think along those lines as they're creating the work alongside with me. That's incredible work. What do you think is next in your future? Um, a lot. <laughs> the future is <laughs> <lot>. bright. <laughs> uh, currently, um, I'm, I'm doing a lot of work, education-wise, I'm doing a lot of work. I Years ago, I developed a, a, a social-emotional learning program under the tutelage of Dr. Peter Salovey, who's the current president of Yale University, on uh, emotional intelligence development. So I, besides when I'm not doing artwork, I teach children how to develop their emotional intelligence skills using art and music and writing. Um, so I'm doing a lot of work with a lot of different organizations across the state, as well as across the country, um, teaching kids from all different walks of life on emotional intelligence development. Um, I'm also working on my next solo exhibition, uh, which will be a historical piece um, pertaining to some of the history of the canal side uh, in Buffalo during the uh, 1850s and 1860s. I'm currently doing that as a residence at the uh, newly built Hunt, uh, Peter J. Hunt Art Gallery in downtown Buffalo. Um, You've got incredible stuff going on, and yes. especially I love how much you're giving back to the youth and the next generation. Uh, social, emotional intelligence is extremely important, and I'm really glad, especially in the black community, that we have we know the importance of it, and we're working on sending that back to our kids to Absolutely. continue that. So thank you for all of your work and the work that you're doing. If you guys want to see more of Jalen's work or try to contact him, you can find more at the JalenLawCollection.com. So to come on Daytime Buffalo, a star is born. We sit down with an idol in the making. Keep it here. That's next. Today, we are lucky and honored to have an American Idol contestant here in the Daytime Buffalo studios. We have Matt Wilson. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, thank you so much for having me. So before we get into the fun part, I want to know about your background, how you got into music and singing and, and how you got here. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, I first started singing when I was about nine years old. Um, you know, then that kind of skyrocketed everything else and I started going to a school called Buffalo Academy for Visual and Performing Arts and a lot of people are familiar with that that live in the city and that's kind of where like my musical journey kind of began and uh, you know I sang in church and things like that growing up. Absolutely I connect with you I also went to a performing arts high school in Manhattan so uh, fun stuff there that's really kind of how you hone your talent and tell me a little bit about your American Idol audition where was it was it here in Buffalo? No, so uh, the way that it all began is that I ended up getting contacted by a casting producer. Oh, wow. And then from there, I did like a couple Zoom auditions. And from there, like they determined, oh, is this guy good enough to for us to go ahead and fly him down to one of our audition cities? And 
I ended up, you know, making it that far, and I was super grateful for to be able to be flown down to New Orleans to do an audition. Yeah. That is so cool. Do you know how many people were at your audition? Around about? Yeah, I think that they went through a couple. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I'm being humble about this because I think that there's more than it. But I think there are like a couple thousand people that they had to go through. Yeah. Um, with the audition, sorry, with the auditions of the zooming and things like that. But oh, then wow. going down to the audition, I think it was about 80 contestants that they had, and they had to filter that down. I think they only took uh, 50 from each city or something like that. Maybe there were more, but I don't know. What is the process like? You step into that audition room. I mean, you, you know, you had a different thing than we we think of people that just like show up one day and audition. I know you had a little bit of a process beforehand, but I'm sure actually going in and not being over Zoom was a little bit nerve-wracking, right? Yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, going over the Zoom, it's like, it's hard because you believe that, you know, you can, you know, just from telling and being in a Zoom call, in any other circumstance, you can tell, like, you're not gonna be able to hear them as clearly as you would if they were in the, the same room as right. you. So, like, I was a little self-conscious, like, man, are they, not, are they gonna hear the entirety of what I'm singing and, like, actually get all the the resonance of my voice but you know I'm super grateful that they were able to like hear me you know the foundation at least I don't know but they ended up saying hey we really think you got what it takes and they flew me down and I'm just I'm so grateful for that <laughs> yeah I have to know because my favorite judge obviously is Katy Perry but yeah. who are the other judges again the other judges are Lionel Richie and Luke Bryan how, yeah. What is Katy Perry like? I just have to know. <laughs> <laughs> Katy is like super, super like, ex she's extravagant with everything that she does. And I feel like that's what makes the show. Mm -hmm. And she's just a kind person, a kind soul. She's really, really sweet. Who's the judge that you've connected with the most? The judge I connected with the most, uh, you know, they might blow a lot of people's minds, but it was Luke Bryan, really. Yeah. Really? Wow. Yeah. What do you think, who is some of your inspirations musically? Uh, inspiration wise with music I really had a connection growing up with Usher um, that like I honestly Neo I'm a 2000s baby so like a lot of the early 2000s R&B music is like kind of where I sat and that's where I developed my musical gifts and things like that where I kind of got my own sound from okay so for those watch your show aired yesterday on Sunday uh, but those who missed it what are the results so for those that missed the results for Sunday I ended up getting the golden ticket and going to Hollywood. So Hollywood, <laughs> golden ticket, congrats. <Yeah. laughs> so thank you so much. Yeah, everybody that watched, everybody support, and I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. It really means a lot to me. Thank you. That is really exciting. What are you, what's your uh, plan for this competition to make sure you continue to go forward? I feel like I want to not just throw all my marbles in at once. I feel like slowly letting loose and like giving them bits and pieces of, of things that I know I can do mm -hmm. it's gonna really make me stand out and like really show a dip like show us something different compared to maybe other contestants on the show and what have the other contestants been like thus far oh I've met so many incredibly talented people like I didn't even imagine that there were this many people that could sing the way that they do on the show so I think that we're all in for a good treat mm -hmm. if we're watching and uh, you know I I've made some really good friends on the way as well this is the real deal. You are making Western New York so proud to be represented in a competition like Thank this. You. I think I can speak for the viewers when we say we're all rooting for you and we wish you the best of luck. We want to see you take it home just for Buffalo. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you guys so for much. having me. <laughs> Appreciate it. Well, February is also American Heart Month, and that means a focus on your heart health. Dr. Malika Marshall tells us the inspirational story of a competitive cyclist who now has a second chance at life thanks to a new heart. Kim Dolan was living a full life as a wife, mom, pastry chef instructor, and self-described exercise fanatic. In order to be able to taste and eat my sweets and my students' sweets, I exercised like a fiend. An avid cyclist, Kim had competed in 15 triathlons and an Ironman competition. But in 2016, she went for a swim and was so winded, she barely finished one lap. Then, while hosting a dinner party... I had to stop during the meal and go lay down, and that's just... It's unheard of. Kim went to the ER and was in severe heart failure. Inside of the muscle walls, all these trabeculations and spongy looking muscle, 
that over time that predisposes the heart to becoming weak and dilated and causes heart failures. Kim was diagnosed with a genetic condition called non-compaction cardiomyopathy. My children and my husband were just, she did an Ironman, what are you talking about? Patients may not have symptoms for years, but eventually the condition worsens. She was treated with medications and used an artificial device to keep her heart pumping. Eventually, Kim needed a heart transplant, and she received her new heart here in Boston at Tufts Medical Center. Our goal when we do a transplant is to get people to get back to some sort of normalcy, get back to their lives, doing what they love. And, uh, you know, Kim is really doing that now. It's been five years since Kim's transplant. Last summer, she took part in a competition for organ recipients and living donors. At 62, she won gold in the 5K and 20K bike races. How did it feel? I think what it was is I'm back. I can do this again. I've, I've done it. Back doing what she loves and living her best life. And still to come, we take you inside the Standard Barber Shop for a look at all of their services. And after that, we're going to the Colored Musicians Club for a closer look of their history. Keep it here, that's all coming up after the break. We're ending or closing out Black History Month. It doesn't end but this month, by Thank the you. way. Thank it you. continues <laughs> on. <laughs> um, but, you know, we've got Melanin March and everything else we can mm. think of after that. But as we close out what the, everyone recognizes as Black History Month, what's been uh, special to you? I mean, barber shops are a staple in the black community. It's where people come to feel good about themselves, to yes. connect, mm. uh, to relieve steam, to talk. You guys are like therapists. Right, so right, right. what's been special for you about owning this shop and being a staple in this community? Um, well, it's been an, an absolute blessing. Um, I've always I consider my space a, a safe space for um, expression, for, you know, just decompression, things of that nature, and so especially for this month, you know, the conversation are always geared toward, you know, how to better ourselves and what, what things we can do to come together and reflecting on our past leaders and, and, and positions we were in and now looking at where we are now in the future or in present, hoping to be, have a better future. It's, it's definitely encouraging to, to have those type of conversations because oftentimes we're, we're not able to, you know, vent or even put some of our concerns on the table, but, you know, with uh, Black History Month, you know, businesses are more, you know, working together. The attention is, you know, drawn um, more pointed on uh, our businesses. So it's really encouraging to see us come together that way. Mm. You've got um, some accolades to talk about, including uh, 30 under 30, which is impressive. Uh, talk to me a little bit about some of the awards you've won. Um, well, 30 under 30, to be um, a particular, it was um, it's one um, award ran by Jamil Cruz in our city, uh, one of our uh, good friends. He's a hard worker for our communities. Um, so I was recognized uh, by my community for, for the work being done. Um, so that, that truly was an honor. I had no idea um, the community voted for me and uh, for various different reasons. And I'm, I'm definitely glad you know, appreciated and seen in that light. And I just hope that I can continue to, to be um, that source of uh, encouragement, uh, an example um, that, some, that some people look to um, and want to represent. Um, it was an honor being there. Uh, I've won various um, barber battles here in the city, you know, recognition for uh, being in business, things like that. So um, those aren't really important, but I do appreciate them. You know, wh what's important to me is the work being done, you know, servicing our community, uh, being a staple, being a voice in the community, um, and letting them know that, you know, we're here, you know, we're here to support, we're here to, you know, to help and listen. So that that's the real, like, accolade for me. Talk to me a little bit about some of the work you do outside of this barbershop within the community. Um, well, I work, I work with um, various um, people. Um, a good friend of mine, Rachel Cunningham, she's a teacher uh, in Niagara Falls. Um, and also uh, she has a support group here in Buffalo as well. And I, I mentor a group of kids um, from, from some of the things that we've experienced here in our city with like the massacres and things like that. We fed our community. Um, we continue to feed our community even well after. Um, I, I have various events here in my barbershop, First Friday events where I do live music, poetries, giveaways. Uh, some of my young um, talent and community, they're artists, so I, I have their work here hung in, our, in my barbershop. So there's many different things I, I try to do uh, for my community. I, I use my space as a, as a, a platform. 
it's not just a barbershop. So, you know, if you have something going on, I try to support it in any way that I can. And it's been a blessing to see so many different things happen in this space from, you know, concerts to, you know, we have a, a book, book club with our Black Boys Read here in Buffalo. Um, just a, a various, various other thing, a variety of things we do here. Why do you think it's important to particularly work with the youth in your community? I mean, it, it, it will sound cliche, but they are our future, you know, so if we don't capitalize uh, with them now and instill in, in them now, uh, then what does our future look like, you know? And I remember being a young person who used to look up to certain individuals, but I didn't know how to get to them, how to, you know, let my dreams, you know, touch their ears. And so with that feeling, now as an adult, I try my best to identify with that when I see youth who have, you know, similar, you know, hiccups or similar, you know, uh, boundaries that they're trying to get over, or hurdles they're trying to get over. And so I try to be that, that space for them. And um, lovely, beautifully, I have been that for them. They've come here and they express things. They want to try this, they want to try that, you know, or they're going through something or going through this. And I've, you know, I went with this one guy, he's um, dear to me. He's like my little brother. You know, I was able to talk to him off the ledge of suicide, you know, because I identified with that, you know, right. and having gone through that. When I was a young person, I saw that in him. And so I thank God that I'm able to, to be in that position. You know, I don't take barbering lightly. It's it's more than just cutting hair. It's 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 community. It's mentorship. It's beauty. It's love. It's art. It's so many different things. And so, I really just try to live that. You know. What do you think is one of the biggest battles the Black community is facing here in Buffalo? Coming together. You know, we we for whatever reasons there are many. We we point. We blame. We, you know, we don't. We, we circumvent. And oftentimes the issues lie with us. The, 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 the results, the end all, lies with us. And the moment we take that accountability and just really live in that space and not just speak it and cry about it, uh, we're gonna see a direct change in our community. When we, when we take back our communities, when we police our communities, and not just in a, in a sense of like policing it, like in a negative connotation, but like in a sense of knowing the pulse of your community, knowing that the person next door is going through this and the, the young man, the young lady is going through that, is that and being a source of, of, of relief, help, that's going to be a better community for us. You know, back in the day, it was that. You know, Big Mom used to sit on the porch and Grandpa, you know, used to, you know, correct the young man walking down the street, pull your pants up or, you know, pull him aside and take him under his wing. That type of love and, and pulse is what's missing, you know, so. So that togetherness is what you try to create here at, I do, your, yeah. at the standard. I try. Mm -hmm. What do you want people to feel when they come into your barbershop, your clients? Oh, first off, welcomed. You know, this is a space welcome for, for all, for anybody. Uh, there's not just one particular you know, walk of life that can come through this door. Um, this is not my space, this is our space. You know, so I want them to know they're welcome. I want them to know that they can, you know, express themselves however they want. Um, it is a respected space, you know, so I'm going to respect you and I, I expect the same back, you know, so if I see a young man coming with his pants hanging down, then no, you have, you have to pull him up because I respect you and, I, and I, see, I see your kingship in you and I want you to see it too. So that type of reception is definitely given here. What makes the standard different than other barbershops in Buffalo? Because it truly is a standard. I hold myself to a certain standard. Um, I'm, I'm going to always do that. And with that, it's going to be a de demarcation um, from the rest. I don't, I don't speak bad about any anyone else in, in similar business, but I know what I provide. I know the atmosphere. I know the dedication, the passion, the time I put into it. Um, and so, with that comes a different level of standard. You know, there's a, there's a different level of expectation of on myself, um, of my clientele, of my community, of my people. And so, with that, it just it's going to be a standard naturally. You know, and then from the business standpoint. I, I know what I deliver, um, I know what I want to deliver, so it's going to be a different level of expectation. What does Black History Month mean to you, or represent to you? Um, it, it represents acknowledgement um, from, for all the, the work that we've done. Um, there's much more that needs to be done in regards to representing us better and, and truer, um, but it's definitely a step in the right direction because we used to have nothing. You know, so it's definitely nice to have this, the conversations. And with the knowledge that you gain, that is a, a catalyst to just open the door to the, the bigger picture of truth. So black history is definitely something appreciated. Um, I'm, I'm proud to be black, and I hope to help other young black people to feel the same joy. Well, thank you for being a change maker, a trailblazer, and trying to do the work to bring this community together. No, thank you very much. My honor.
Black History Month, Jasmine Bailey from our sister station in Cleveland, Ohio, shows us how the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame honors game-changing black performers and their lasting impact on music and culture. The story of rock and roll begins at its root. Rock and roll is not a genre that was built and grown in a vacuum. It's inspired by so many other amazing genres. Waka Anwusa, chief curator at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, says gospel, blues, country, folk, bluegrass, all led to today's melting pot of music that we call rock. Many of its pioneers are black. You're talking about the Robert Johnsons, the John Lee Hookers, B.B. King, so many amazing bluesmen who have impacted the sound of rock and roll, who have inspired the sound of rock and roll, R&B, funk, hip hop. An undeniable evolution traced through the dozens of Black Rock Hall inductees. Nina Simone, <laughs> um, she was inducted in 2018. Isaac Hayes to Ray Charles, James Brown, Jay-Z, LL Cool J. I mean, our list goes on from past, present, and future. Celebrating the past includes a deep look at black artists' fusion of music and activism from public enemy inductees who brought socially conscious rap to the masses. They were very raw in their message. The lyrics that we actually have on display in this exhibit called It's Been Said All Along is Fight the Power. I mean, fight the powers that be. To Aretha Franklin, the first woman ever inducted. Franklin performed at Radio City Music Hall in this Valentino dress, singing Respect, a song that became the battle cry of a generation. These are like anthems to encourage you through your fight, through your social justice fight, through your fight as a woman. Here at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, black artists are also celebrated for bringing the world music that sparks joy. You could argue no one does that like Earth, Wind & Fire. On display, some of the elements dazzling capes from their stage sets. Each exhibit an opportunity to tell the personal stories of icons like Tina Turner, who overcame domestic violence and owned the 80s, to Whitney Houston and Lionel Richie, who on Woosa says made music that was at times deemed not black enough. Both of them stood strongly and stood so firmly in saying, I just want to make music just good music. The struggle behind the music never overshadowing its impact. That's the thing about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame when you come into this space, learning about these artists, like, oh my God, you know, like you identify with that moment, that song, that artifact, that dress, that music video. And there's so many mediums that are celebrated here to educate, inspire, and spark that joy. Johnny be good. So to come, the music and soul of a city comes alive. We go inside the Color Musicians Club. Stick with us. That's next. The Colored Musicians Club is a Western New York staple, and today it remains as strong a foundation as ever for black musicians in the 716. In honor of Black History Month, we take you inside for a look at how the institution came to be. Located in the historic African American Heritage Corridor in Buffalo, the Colored Musicians Club has been a pillar of the community for over 80 years, and its legacy goes back over 100. It took a while up until 1917 before this uh, group of musicians would finally be allowed to have their own local. If you were a musician of color, you weren't allowed into the union. I mean, that was just the law of the land. But it gave them a, a sense of security now because they knew being in the union, they would get paid the proper wage, wages and, uh, you know, they, they won't be cheated. Then later on, when we talk about the 30s, this building would become available. Uh, that was really when this union took off. Lifelong musician and now curator of the Buffalo Jazz Museum, George Scott, fondly remembers how he came across the club when he was just 13. One day I heard the saxophone and I kind of fell in love with that. When I was getting reads, uh, I asked the gentleman who was on the store, could he refer me to a 
saxophone instructor. He said, well, this guy here, he'll help you. Introduced himself, you know, I'm, uh, you know, Mr. Graf Young. You know, I'm a musician from the Colored Musicians Club. And then I was sitting in the middle of it like, wow, I can't believe I'm sitting here with all these guys. They took me under their wing and, and taught me how to be a, you know, jazz musician and, uh, and really give back to the community as well. What this club really symbolized was they were community-minded musicians. So we wanted to form this museum. So first of all, we tell their stories. And at the same time, we want to instill, hey, you know, you could be a part of something special. And it's that special something that George loves sharing with others, passing on the music and history of the club to the many students that visit the Jazz Museum. For some of them, it hits home, you know, it's says, oh, wow, that's interesting. You know, I kind of deal, dealt with that or I've seen a family member go through that. And the fact that they see these people dealt with that and then they overcame it and look where, they, where it took them. But the other thing, too, is just seeing that that was a great part of the history and what they're dealing with back then while they were trying to create this music. I mean, it's almost similar to what things are happening today. I mean, you're talking about, you know, racism raising his head up again and, you know, a lot of stuff that happened back in the 50s. And, you know, to let them know that, you know, these guys were activists. These guys were leaders. And uh, they, they fought. They, they took chances just to get the word out. For George and the members of the club, the music, legacy, and continued service to the community is the perfect harmony and something he always says is, quote, more than just jazz. As Black History Month comes to a close, a program in Maryland is doing its part to keep farming culture alive in minority communities, and the work is creating a new generation of growers across the country. Skylar Henry introduces us to an alliance of farmers getting back to their roots. <laughs> this group of ladies may be small. Sisters are all for one and one for all. <laughs> But they run this large four acre farm just outside of Washington, D.C., where crops are coming, and more importantly for the group, so are an abundance of seeds. What happened was people stopped saving seeds, and every year the price of seeds go up, and every year it's harder and harder to get the seeds you want. Bonita Adib runs the Ujama Cooperative Farming Alliance under the nonprofit Steam Onward, bringing together black and indigenous farmers in and around Maryland and the initiative has gained national recognition. We love watermelon, we love okra, we love sorghum, you know, uh, all those things that are important to our ancestors, that's, that's what we love and that's what we grow. Across the nation, less than 1% of farms are black owned, which limits minorities' access to the $15 billion seed growing industry. Adib rolled up her sleeves once she and her team recognized the need to promote minority representation in the agriculture space. They also address what she says is a lack of access to natural, unfertilized food. Ujama's progress is growing dividends. Their online seed catalog doubled in the last year and contains just about every seed you can think of, from squash to corn to quinoa. It's all there. The work is building a network of farmers with a range of experience. What's your biggest takeaway from doing this work? It's a sense of community, sense of seeing how others are working in their community and there are thousands and thousands of us out there and the only way we can beat any type of obstacle is to work together and work through it. Bridging a gap of culture and connecting a new generation of growers. We would like to thank every one of our guests today, Uncrowned Queens Institute, Jalen Law, Matt Wilson from American Idol. We're wishing you the best of luck as you continue your journey, the Standard Barber Shop, and the Colored Musicians Club. Now it's time for a pop culture quiz. Our production supervisor, James, will be asking me questions, and you, the viewers, can play along, yell out at the screen, or tweet me your answers. Okay, James. Well, happy Monday. Happy Monday. Here's a good first question for you. Who were the original three judges on American Idol? Paula Abdul, Simon Cowell, and uh, Randy. What's his last name? Jackson. Jackson. Close enough. That's good. That's good. Kind of a topical one today. 
Here's another good one. Yeah, you watched Full House as a kid. Yes, I did. Okay. How old were Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen when they began their acting career? Didn't they start when they were like infants? Yes. Yeah, I've, I've heard that. They were like Nine in some months. commercial. <laughs> yes. <And laughs> They've been working. Acting, you know. Yeah, you acting know. as yeah. much as you can act as at nine months. Here's another <laughs> interesting one. Uh, who was the first woman to ever appear on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine? I do know this one, I think. Tina Turner. Yes. That's yeah. Right. I didn't know that one. I oh. knew. I know her. She's a uh, very. She's the queen. That's Tina good. Turner, the musical. That's <laughs> and here's another uh, American Idol question. Which American Idol alumni served as lead vocalist for the band Queen since 2011? I, <laughs> I have no clue. Adam Lambert. Oh yes, yes, Does yes. A very good job. He's a yeah. He's great. He's great. And then, um, what popular television sitcom earns the most money in syndication? Was it Friends? Is it? It's yeah, Friends. Friends. Yeah. There you go. Oh, okay, thanks, James. I hope you had fun playing along with me. Daytime Buffalo will be back tomorrow afternoon at 3 right here on Channel 4. We'll see you then.